Welcome to Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. I'm Peter Gross, co-host of the original Wild Kingdom with Marlon Perkins and Jim Fowler. You know, if there's one thing we've learned when filming Wild Kingdom, it's that nature can be harsh. Not all animals are strong and healthy enough to survive. In tonight's episode, we'll explore the relationship between predators and prey. Each plays an important role in keeping animal populations in check. The old and sickly animals are naturally weeded out, leaving the strong and healthy to produce the next generation. In fact, birds of prey like this owl are only successful about 50% of their attempts to catch food in the wild. This reality can seem harsh, but it's absolutely necessary to create that delicate yet natural balance of animals in the wild kingdom. So sit back and relax and enjoy Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom right here on RFD TV. Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom is presented by the company with coverage for everyone. Mutual of Omaha. Welcome to Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. We're listening to the call of the barred owl. Listen. Pretty eerie sound, eh, Mr. Moke? The hooting of the barred owl is a sound that's commonly heard in one of the most mysterious and enchanting regions of the world. A water wilderness we call the land of quaking earth. Mr. Moke, I'm not sure you'd do too well in that land, particularly after you see the kind of animal that Jim Fowler has over there in the den. Now you stay right there while I put the owl back. Okay, no fair grabbing now. Stay on my back. Whoop. No, Mr. Moke. You were a pex bad boy. I don't think you'd ever make a falconer. Moke, you better not get too close to him now because he's not going to be afraid of you like that old owl. This is the largest freshwater turtle in North America. It's called the alligator snapping turtle. And he's one of the more dangerous animals that's found in this land of quaking earth. His weapon is this very powerful jaw and that sharp beak. And he can almost take your leg off if he happens to catch you. Yeah, he's known as Mr. Amputator. You may think this area we've been talking about is in some remote region of the world far removed from civilization, hidden in a tropical rainforest or in some inaccessible mountain region. But instead, it's found on the densely populated coastal plain of the eastern United States. Here in southeast Georgia, near the Florida border, Nature has created a wild wonderland encompassing nearly 700 square miles of primitive swamp. The Indians call this land of quaking earth Okefenokee. Jim and I received an official welcome from Joe Morton, director of the Okefenokee National Wildlife Refuge. He told us of certain areas we should be sure to visit. Then he introduced us to wildlife officer Jewett Hall, who would guide us to those places. It's a matter of record that men have gone into the Okefenokee never to be seen again. And there are even legends of lost tribes. So we were mighty happy to be in the company of this man who carried a road map in his head. Passing through a hidden entrance, we moved into the intricate maze of narrow water trails that wind through the cavernous swamp. The dark waters reflect towering stands of age-old cypress decked in Spanish moss. Blankets of water lilies lie on the surface, and the edges are fringed with iris, ferns, canes, and grasses. It's a fairyland jungle, a place of rare beauty and quiet mystery. This is one of the last great strongholds of the alligator. Here he is the king of beasts. 
fearing no animal and feared by nearly all. A gray fox is asking for trouble when he enters these waters. And trouble is never far away. This fellow got out just in time. Our first glimpse of a bear was a foretaste of an adventure in store for us later. One of the real dangers in traveling through the swamp is the water moccasin who often suns himself on low overhanging branches. We wanted to catch this one and because he's extremely poisonous, great care must be taken in handling him. Opening his mouth reveals his deadly fangs hinged to his upper jaw and show the distinctive white lining that gives him his common name, Cottonmouth. With his brownish color and dark crossbands, the Cottonmouth closely resembles the common water snake, which is harmless. But unless you really know your snakes, I'd recommend you don't take any chances. Traveling through the Okefenokee, just when you've accustomed yourself to the jungle darkness, you round a bend and find yourself in another world, a world of wide open marshland. Although these grassy areas are called prairies, they're mighty wet prairies. Water flows across at a depth of from one to four feet, except where the bottom rises here and there to form islands, known as houses or hammocks. Across the prairies, Standing out in sharp contrast against the dark forest are the magnificent winged fishermen of the swamp. Here in safety, the American egret can display the regal plumage for which he was once hunted so savagely. The Okefenokee is a happy hunting ground, not only for the zoologist, but for the botanist as well. Many rare plants have been discovered here, including one that bears the nickname soap plant. Naturally, we had to test it. You have to be careful where you wash your hands in these parts. In the early days, it was the only soap the Indians of the swamp had. It really cleaned. It looked as though my splashing had frightened a raccoon out of the water. But I was not the real cause of his concern. As a result of all this commotion, a big bull gator suddenly started to bellow, asserting his claim over his territory. And he was answered all across the swamp. In the Okefenokee, you can never be sure that what appears to be solid ground is really solid. Much of the vegetation, even the trees, are not in contact with the ground at all, but are rooted in the floating upper crust of the peat bed. Hence the name, Land of Quaking Earth. Of course I had to try it out. I had to try it too. And I soon found out why the long pole is standard equipment here for pedestrians.
You're probably familiar with the famous Stephen Foster song, Way Down Upon the Suwannee River. If so, you may be surprised to know that the Okefenokee contains the headwaters of the famous Suwannee River, which carries most of its waters out to the Gulf of Mexico. Unlike some swamps in which the water is stagnant, the Okefenokee contains pure water that flows slowly but continuously across the open prairies, through the dense forests, along alligator trails, and twisting water courses. Here and there, an island rises out of the water, and on one of the larger islands, we established our camp. With us here was swamper Johnny Hickok, chief guide of Okefenokee Swamp Park. Johnny was a walking library of swamp lore. One of his tales concerned a secret island in the swamp said to be the most blissful spot on earth. Unfortunately, he didn't know where it was. So Jim and I set off separately to explore the island we were on. I stopped at a quiet inlet and before long spotted a fox squirrel named for his bushy fox-like tail. This is the largest tree squirrel in the United States. He must be pretty hungry because this is the first time I ever saw a fox squirrel eat a lily pad. Next I saw a family of mallard ducks. Now ducks and a squirrel pose no problem in peaceful coexistence. But when a bobcat enters the scene, that's different. to escape from a hungry bobcat. But the water has its problems too. Now the bobcat goes back to chasing the ducks, and this is his fatal mistake. found a paradise for birds, a rookery alive with cattle egrets, American egrets, and little blue herons. Swamps are favorite haunts of such wading birds. They're all spearfishers, hunting in the shallow waters and returning to the nests in the rookeries. I was able to move right up on two American egrets. They were young ones and still at the awkward age, not yet expert in flying. On close examination, I could see that they would soon leave the nest. While they're still young, this is an ideal sanctuary. They can stay beyond the reach of predators by perching in the bushes, using their wings as well as their legs to move about and spread their weight. Besides, I can testify from personal experience that it's mighty difficult for any predator to get in through that brush, water, and mud. Few people came calling at our camp in the swamp, so we were anticipating excitement as we stood by to greet Warden Johnston of the Georgia Game and Fish Commission. When he explained his mission, we were all eager to join forces with him. The problem was a bear that had taken to living near the edge of the swamp, quite close to a town, too close for the safety of the townspeople or the bear. If he left the refuge, he was liable to be shot Johnstone had located the bear. Our assignment now was to help capture him and relocate the bear far back inside the swamp. Our plan was to drive the bear up a tree and rope him there. But when we came out into a small lake, 
What we saw made us quickly change our strategy. The bear was in the water, and if we tried to run him ashore, we'd lose him. The only thing to do was to try to lasso him from the boat. When there's only one rope on a bear, you don't have him, he's got you. So to control him, I had to put a second rope on him. If I ever had doubts about the strength of a bear, they were ended that day. Even with two outboards working for us, the bear could outpull us. What we needed was a foothold. So once we'd maneuvered him into shallow water, we had to abandon the boat and use our own muscles to pull him ashore. There must be a better way of catching a bear than in the water like that. It's one thing to get a rope on him, but it's another thing to handle a bear safely and still be able to transport him through the swamp. That's right. Warden Johnston had already deposited a bear cage in the general area. It didn't take long for him and Johnny Hickok to go and get it, but it seemed long to those of us who were left holding the bear. We estimated the weight of this male bear to be about 350 pounds, and that he was about three years old. It was all we could do to hold the bear near the cage. Finally, he decided it was safer inside than out. To support the weight of the bear and cage, two boats had been lashed together as a catamaran to give the required stability. Our route of travel had to be carefully charted because moving a caged bear through the narrow swamp trails of the Okefenokee is a difficult task. Building up the bear population is one of the long-range conservation goals of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. So our job now was to select a large island in the interior of the swamp that would be a good habitat for bears, providing good cover and plenty of food. After much searching, we found a suitable island. But at first, the bear was cautious about entering his new home. But once he got ashore, he set a new track record. We waited to see if he would adjust to his new habitat. 
It didn't take long for him to start ripping up the landscape to get at bark and pulp and other favorite delicacies. Following the bear, we covered a good part of the island. He had several encounters with other animals that already lived there. The first one he met was a young red-shouldered hawk who had just learned to fly. to an alligator, it was a different story. to take care of themselves. And when predators meet, there's bound to be a conflict. Now a bobcat may think a young alligator is an easy victim. But a young alligator is one of the scrappiest animals there is. Another real fighter is the snapping turtle. At the approach of a water moccasin, most turtles would retreat inside their shells, but not the snapper. For him, the water moccasin is a potential meal. The fangs of the snake and the powerful jaws of the turtle are both lethal weapons. snake strikes a vital spot, and they're locked in a grip of death. The one animal on the island that usually comes out best in any encounter is the skunk, thanks to his experience with chemical warfare. He doesn't need to back up from anyone, as our bear soon found out. and he adds insult to injury by splashing water in the bear's face. with the skunk didn't affect the bear's sense of smell because it wasn't long until he'd found a tree filled with honey. This is his favorite food. Finding it is a good indication that he will successfully adapt to his new home in this magnificent land of quaking earth. Jim, you know the bear will have a much better existence on that island than he had where we caught him, whether he knows it or not. <laughs> yes, he should have all he needs to survive there. Plenty of food, good shelter, and good protection. Millions of years ago, prehistoric seas receded from the continent of North America, leaving a vast lake. Seasons came and went, and decaying vegetation gradually filled the lake, forming a rich muck in which plant life thrived and animals found homes. Thus, nature worked for countless centuries to create this unique natural sanctuary, which the red man described as the land of quaking earth. And today, this fabulous plot of primitive America is held in trust to be forever a part of the wild kingdom. <laughs> The company with health insurance for people of all ages has presented Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom.
like what you saw? Follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube for more exclusive content. And visit our website at wildkingdom.com. Mutual of Omaha. Protect your kingdom.